We're back for season two. Yes, it's bigger. It's badder. It's... I'll just get on with it. Bad scripts. Well, hello and welcome back to Bad Scripts. It's been a little while, but we have returned for more of Season 2, Chapter 2. And of course, I would be amiss if I didn't at first introduce my co-host, best friend and confidant, the effervescent Mr. Mike Garlia. Good evening, Mike. Good evening, Steve. How are you? I- I'm well, thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm well. It's been a, a week of personal reflection and contemplation and all the things that have happened, especially here in the UK. But we won't dwell on that. There's been enough coverage of all of that. What I will say is I'm feeling good. I'm feeling positive, And I'm really looking forward to today's episode. How are you? I I, I am fine. And it's interesting. Um, so, yes, to, to our listeners who are waiting patiently for a new episode, it's been a while. And we, you know, it's like stepping right back into that pair of trousers that feel snug and comfortable for you if that's indeed a thing that you have um, but we we haven't disappeared we've been writing furiously in the background and getting everything ready for the next uh, for the next run of <laughs> of episodes so we we took that time um to be to, a to be sensitive and be to to do some work so um we are almost there now and we've got some crackers coming up in terms of how this story is going to progress would you agree with that steve i i think that's fair to say i think you know my words earlier on social media were this stuff's on fire quite literally on fire so i think it's going to be you know explosive to say the least well, it's interesting you say those words, explosive, fire, because that's really synonymous with the changing of the season. And that is the season we are now going into, um, which I, I, I must admit is one of my favourite seasons. So coming into autumn, I absolutely love it. Um, but I want to ask you, Steve, that question, because we talked about summer and how excited we were about summer. We talked about summer anthems and this, that and the other. Um, what is it about autumn that you like the most if anything do you like it do you not like it because there's a certain type of profile that people can say oh i just love autumn yeah i I, and i get that because you see the images the 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 wonderful rich reds and golds and the you know the trees um but you know it's a time of reflection as well it's a it's a changing from the the bright the, the 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 long daylight hours and we start to reflect a little more on on and I think we look more internally once once those curtains get closed earlier in the day we really reflect you know and I think back and I think you know I had joy I had fun and I had some seasons in the sun but the hills on the side there are seasons have all gone so now I like to think um about you know curling up in front of a nice roaring fire with a book and just relaxing now I don't have a roaring fire and I don't read that many read. books. Yeah, well, there is that, yeah. that side does, does hamper it. Small. I do have some picture books that I can look through. So you know, <laughs> I'm quite pop-ups? happy. Um, I, I've got a, I've got a thesaurus. It's rubbish, and it's also rubbish. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to stop with the bad jokes tonight. I think I, you know, dad jokes have come out, and I don't know why what's happened to me, but I sorry, think I, I just feel you... more playful in 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 autumn. So there's an answer to your question. We've got, you. Um, you know, uh, Halloween is just around the corner, um, and you know, there's a there's an impishness to uh, to my mood. So, you know, apologies now if I make any um, random quips throughout so this episode. You you came in quite romantically then of the changing of the season, the golds and the oranges and the browns and the darker nights and the roaring fires and my pop-up book and thesauruses, which if you spend time reading a thesaurus, uh, Steve, um, you probably need to speak to someone um, out with our, our, our little circle um, about why. Yeah, I mean, I, I can look for therapy um but i i find therapy in our conversation and i find therapy in our work yeah. but i know the truth i know the truth right after all that romanticizing let me tell you why people love autumn 
And why is that? They've spent six weeks with their kids <laughs> in the summer <laughs> with really long days. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the, the changing of the season means shorter days and gets shorter and shorter and shorter, as we know. Mm. Um, it means the kids go back to school which gives us that freedom again that we that we that we're accustomed to right through the spring and uh, and also uh, you know that that sense of halloween i think you're right that's the countdown to the to the christmas season whoa whoa, coming, whoa, you know? whoa whoa we weren't going to mention the c word we weren't we we're, we're not mentioning the c word i i think that's important because literally as soon as august is over my wife starts tagging me in social media posts about christmas things and i'm like can we get Halloween, my birthday, and a few other things out of the way, my son's birthday, before we even start thinking about Christmas? Um, you you realise in your order of preference there, your son's birthday came last in, in that list you just gave. That, was that, was that, that random was, or was that? That was chronologically. So chronological. that, that wasn't importance to me, obviously. That was more chronological. So, that, you know. That was a reminder for me to get a birthday present on two you know, two birthday presents now, Steve. Jeez, I always forget I'm terrible. <laughs> no, not at all. The gift you give me with, of your company is more than enough and... All I get, so I just have to accept it. <laughs> I'm just kidding, of course. Mike is a very generous gift giver. I've never known anybody who is as quick at producing a gift card as Mike across the globe. <laughs> it's a thing. It's a thing. <laughs> it's all. It's all a yeah. joke. There, there is. There is no. There is no comeback for that. Yes, I am known <laughs> as the gift card king. Um, if you're going to get a gift from me, it's usually going to be a gift card. It's going to be digital, and it doesn't come with a practical card, as you well know. I, I do understand, Mike, but I, I do have to ha ask. That last year, I've still not spent my Victoria Secrets card because frankly nothing fits me so um next well, year maybe pers persevere persevere because i've been waiting to see this at least, you know like obviously if i give you that and i want to see what you buy i, I um, do realize it's a gift for you as much as it is for me um but the ladies in the shop have been a little bit sort of put off by me going in and trying everything especially on because... when you give them back um those thongs and stuff yeah i, I can yeah, see where the, not... where the issue comes from there absolutely so, <laughs> on that note, I guess we should talk about the script and where we left things. Um, we've been Judy's show, the Battle of the Bands, have been a roaring success, much to Bernie's displeasure um, and his uh, cronies, and, and and an olive branch possibly from the Robin and Adam situation, and some thawing on Robin's behalf. Is it fair to say? Well, time heals all, right? It, it does. does. I mean, it? Does it? I mean, not amputations, obviously, but um, it you know, uh, emotional he uh, emotional problems. Yeah, sometimes. So that conflict was reasonably superficial, I think. But let's hope they can patch things up because you know they they became good friends last year, and it would be sad if this was the end of of what was a beautiful friendship. Mm. I, I agree, and I am not giving any spoilers away whatsoever in terms of what is coming up, uh, because in addition to that, we've also had Bernie make his commitment that his show will be ready and will be on on time. And, uh, you know, and I, I don't mind saying this, we're now into the final act of this particular chapter uh, where things do need to start happening. So, yeah, I think I Bernie think cannot delay any longer. Basically, it's put up or shut up you know your reputation will only get you so far you know you're only as good as your last show so on you go and and let's see how uh, uh what what he's made of i guess so without further ado what's to say we head back down to the coast to camp holidays and see what's happening right now interior alan's office Day. Seated around the table are John, Alan, Bernie and Marjorie, the accountant. The tension in the room is palpable. After a few moments, the phone on Alan's desk starts ringing. Alan gets up and answers it. Yes, this is Alan. Yes. No, we're expecting him on the live feed. He's waiting. Oh, right. N no, no. Uh, that, no, that's fine. Yes, yes, please. Uh, dial him in. Alan puts the phone down, walks back to the desk 
and opens the call. Hello? Hi, Glenn. It's Alan. Uh, in the room, you have Bernie, John and Marjorie. Good. Um, I expect this meeting to be snappy. Um, updates, please. John, do you want to kick us off? John clears his throat. <coughs> Quite too much? <laughs> well, I, I just said he'd done it, so you didn't probably didn't need to do it. <laughs> Sorry, I was just getting in the moment. That's I don't cool. know how much no, no, clearing of his throat he was doing. He he, he had yeah, a lot in there. It sounded like he had it. emphysema, to be fair. I think uh, he, he had a, he had a Cumberland sausage in there, to be honest. So okay, <laughs> okay, back in the room. Hi, right, Glenn. So the evacuations, the evacuation. <laughs> what? Are we going back to 1940 now? What's going on? No, he's just evacuating what's in his mouth. Um, Is that sausage again? (laughs) It's that sausage. There we go. Every mistake we make, we'll blame it on the Cumberland. Hi, Glenn. So, the Xeti suites are ready, and I'm pleased to say that we are a go on the grand opening. I'm sure Marjorie has mentioned that we came in a slightly over budget. This is good news, John. I'm happy. Well done. I know it was a bit of a last-minute scramble, uh, but where are we in the opening? Alan here, Glenn. We're still finalising plans, and we have a short list of celebrity endorsements. Um, We've got... I don't know what Alan's accent is then. Alan's just kind of gone a bit... He went a bit northern there, didn't he? He went a bit northern. He he did, Alan. Right. Sorry, yeah. Okay, this is just like kind of punching back into it. Uh, Alan here, Glenn. We're still finalising plans, and we have a short list of celebrity endorsements. We've got five families lined up to sleep with a star, so there'll be uh, some golden marketing opportunities there. (laughs) You're not serious, right? Is that what we're going with? Uh, Going with what? Sleep with the stars. That's not really the image we want to portray, is it? We're not prostituting celebrities now, are we? Ah, yes. I mean, good point. Um, Yeah, uh, we'll we'll, we'll change. We'll, We'll change the title. So who? Who what, Glenn? Which celebrities are you thinking of? Alan ruffles his papers, looking for the list. Ah, yes, here it is. Um, Well, we have Chris Akibusi, Frank Bruno and Anika Rice are all in. Uh, We're speaking to Barrymore's people, but he wants a hot tub. Uh, Kylie was a pass, but we could get Jason, no problem. Uh, We're thinking of Bernard Manning for the older crowd. Uh, we tried Jim Davidson, but he's focused on his panto. Uh, the back of the list is Wolf and Lightning from the Gladiators, uh, Pat Sharp and the Tango Man, uh, though he's getting a bit of heat from all the slapping. Who the hell are these people? Uh, well, they are well known over here, Glenn. Uh, very much on the pulse of current celebrity culture. This isn't big enough. I don't want any pseudo celebrities. I want big stars. I want Hollywood. Is this really the best that you can do? Oh, yes. I'm afraid that's the best we've got, Glenn. That wasn't a question, Alan. It was a challenge. Well, what do you have in mind? Alan shoots Marjorie a concerned and angry look. Pitt, De Niro, Pacino, Sandler, Schwarzenegger. Cruz, Stallone, Madonna, a bloody Swayze for crying out loud. Celine Dion, Gwen Stefani, Christian Slater, that Austin Powers man, or at least one James Bond. I mean, Moore or Connery, stay away from Dalton. Alan rubs his temples. Uh, Okay, Glenn. Um, Yes, I I get where you're going with this. Uh, Leave it with me and, you know, uh, we'll see what we can do. Bernie. How's my show looking? Ah, uh, yes, there's a, there's a very small snag, a, a slight delay, nothing serious. I mean, maybe just a week or two of adjustments. Are you suggesting pushing the show back? Well, yes, Glenn, I am, ju- just to be sure. Are you serious? Bernie looks around the room at everyone's faces. They all avert their eyes. Well, Glenn, if you want the show to be perfect and everything we dreamed about, then you'll need to wait a little bit longer. I'm happy to discuss this in private. The door suddenly opens and stood there, phone to his ear, is Glenn. He strides straight into the room. 
Good. Let's discuss this right now. Ooh, Glenn's in the building. How very exciting. Uh, I, uh, Glenn, Glenn is asking for a lot there. Um, every single uh, Hollywood movie star of the day, right? So um, so I think we might need to explain um, this sleeping with the stars concept is uh, just to harp back to a previous episode with the uh, marketing manager was talking about how they market and sell these new, new executive suites. The, the uh, sales were, were quite low and they decided to put a gimmick in place where they would market out a particular suite to a celebrity who would endorse it they would name it after them and what they've come up with is this idea called sleeping with the stars which i agree has really weird connotations to it <laughs> um i think the innocence is you're going to sleep in a suite with the stars you, no, you're that sharing even accommodation worse. with a you're celebrity accommodation. You're basically it's an opportunity to live a few days have a holiday with a celebrity isn't it which is yeah. which sounds awesome but then when they've tried to boil it down to a a terminology they've really they've really not got it very well so let me let me ask you because this is about personal opinion i'm going to take hollywood out of the equation right now uh steve yeah who would you if you had to choose between these following people who would you choose to stay with in a in a suite um and spend the whole weekend with are you ready for this chris hakibusi frank bruno annika rice um jason donovan bernard manning um wolf or lightning from the gladiators pat sharp or the tango man you did miss Barrymore out there, so oh, you know so I mean. I'm so, that was on purpose as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, just yes. don't go swimming. It's um, we're really we're really running hot this week, aren't we? That's why I said, yeah, there's fireworks. It's us getting fired. Um, you know what? I would happily share with any of them. It sounds like a cop out, but all of them for different reasons I think would be really interesting to talk to, you know. Akabusi's done the Olympics. Bruno's been a world championship, a world a world boxing heavyweight champion. He's fought Mike Tyson. You know, Annika Rice has run around a lot with a camera on a bum. I mean there's so Cam- many Did you just say a camera up a bum? Like a car? On on Oh sorry, I misheard you. On sorry. not up. That's a oh, very sorry, different I, I, I show. I a very it. different show. Um and you know, there's a few in there that you kind of go. I'm not sure I'd want to spend the week with Jim Davidson or, or Bernard Manning in that in that close quarters. But you know, I think Jason Donovan would be interesting to hear all about his time on Neighbours and you know, uh, get his thoughts on you know small scale lotteries and things like that. Um, and then um, yeah, I, Michael Barrymore, he could throw a party from from what I've heard. So all of them have their benefits. What about you? Um- well, um, my my test right. My, I'm going to put a few a few rules in place here to try and whittle down because I think you have copped out and you haven't chosen one. Um, so, who would hog the bathroom longest? Who would be the smelliest in the bathroom that I have to then follow? And who would be an absolute nightmare to sleep next to, as in in the similar room due to snoring or noise and stuff? So, I'm going to whittle this down. I think Bruno um, would be a bit of a um, well. I think he'd drop a deuce and a half, and that might be a bit you know stinky afterwards and i think and, and it's the only person in that list that could compete with you on that front i think probably uh <laughs> annika rice i think is very very kinetic and she just wouldn't be able to sit still so i wouldn't be able to relax in a in a living room she'd want to run around and she want to throw treasure hunt challenges out every two minutes and i think i get annoyed like annika so tell me how you feel today well i'll tell you but you got to find this clue first i think that would um that would kind of great after a while um I think Jason might be all right. He might be good, but I don't know. I think there might be a bitterness there in terms of how his career panned out. He didn't become a famous pop star like Kylie. I don't know, uh, uh, but that'd be interesting. That's arguable at this time. Yeah. I Bernard Manning's a definite no. <laughs> definite, definite no. Um, Jim Davison, probably not. Um, Wolf used to frighten the absolute life out of me, <laughs> as did Lightning when I was a kid. Can you and- imagine if you were sharing a room with them and the sort of, sleep pugilistic fighting they'd be doing and stuff they'd be swinging from the lampshades like there were there were they, flashbacks they to show but wolf would hog the bathroom because he's got all that hair he's got a man oh can you on. imagine if you got him imagine if you got him and pat sharp i mean the amount of cfc's in the, in the air there from the hairspray 
that's dangerous territory. Really, yeah, I, I I completely agree. And uh, and and the Tango Man. Well, you don't want to follow. You got to sleep with one eye open with that man. He's an absolute lunatic. Now, if anyone remembers it, that's right. If anyone, you may not remember this, especially for our, our Atlantic across the pond listeners. Was there was this advert running in the in the nineties about this big guy, heavy set guy, painted in orange. And when someone would drink a can of a tango, in order to for them to sell how tangy it was, and it was like a slap to the face, he would go around with a double slap and kind of slap both cheeks, and it became a kind of viral sensation. So all school kids at school were going around slapping each other in the faces, but a double slap. And what they, what they found was they were like kind of bursting eardrums because they were doing it right yeah. over the ears and pushing air in and there. Just- so it. They justify it by just going, you've been tangoed, and then whack each you, other you, on the you, ears. Yeah. yeah, you've been tangoed, and it happened a few times. You've been tangoed. So I don't think – so for me, it's Chris Akabusi. Awesome, and I think you'd have a great time. And Chris's, Chris's laugh alone is just so infectious that, you know, Absolutely. if anybody I, out there has never heard of Chris or, or you know, look him up on Google, watch some videos on YouTube, he is such a personality and such a uh, a genuinely nice guy. I think he would be great company. So that, that's an awesome choice. Mike. Well, if you're talking about last Frank Bruno's up there as well, isn't he? I mean, oh, he, yeah. he, he was <laughs> heavily. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean, Harry? You know what I mean, Harry? Hey. <laughs> so um, I think maybe a question to our to our listeners um, of the list. And if you know and recognize some of these people, who would you like to spend? And, a, and if, uh, you, if you put a comment in, just put the name. So people who are not reading a thread, just put the name, just put the name on our threads and, 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 uh, and we'll know what it means, but other people out there will be like, why are you talking about Wolf from Gladiators? I don't understand what's going on. Yeah, and then we get a cease and desist from Wolf because someone copies him in on the, on the <laughs> link. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Interior, caravan, night. Adam and Paul are sat on the long sofa in the living area of the caravan, staring intently at the TV. Paul is dressed in a t-shirt and shorts. His extremely thin legs sprawled out towards Adam, displaying his talon-like yellow toenails. Adam, overtly aware of this, has a look of disgust on his face as Paul repeatedly scratches the flaky skin on his arms. Uh, classic this. Uh, yeah, yeah, I went to I went to the cinema to see it. Uh, I would have loved to. But... Uh, but it was uh, great in there. Yeah, it was all right. Um, me and my friend used to dodge classes when we were at college and, you know, go to flicks instead. Yeah, I never took you for a sky either. But it, it wasn't really like that. It was performing art school, so we'd always skip set design. Technically, we were still learning by going to the movies, you know, education through medium of film. Uh, that just sounds like bullshit to me. Uh, funny. Um, <laughs> that's what my lecturer said as well. There is a knock at the door. Adam gets up to answer it. We stay on Paul as we can hear Muffle talking. Then the sound of steps making their way towards the living area. Sally takes off her coat, smiles, and sits down. All right. Are you Paul? Are you okay? Uh, which one are you, Sally? I was literally on the health the skelter talking to you for 20 minutes this morning. Adam sits down next to Sally. She immediately cuddles into him. How was your shift? It was so funny. There was this family. Well, the dad mostly. He was absolutely out of it, trying to dance with everybody, knocking kids out of the way and stuff. Then Billy Jean comes on and I swear he tried to moonwalk. Well... He kicked this woman in the back by accident. She went flying and a bloke came running up and proper belted him round the back of his head. Security came and everything. Normal shift then. Yeah. What you been doing? Not much. Just just watching this. Sally smiles and kisses Adam, lightly biting his bottom lip. They kiss more passionately as Paul watches at the corner of his eye. Sally moves into a comfortable position in front of Adam. She runs her hands up and down his thighs, lightly petting him. Adam, in return, massages his shoulders. Oh, that's lovely, that. Hold on. Sally removes her zipper, revealing a tight white vest underneath. Adam resumes his massage. Paul watches and runs his tongue over his lips, 
Adam catches his eye and Paul looks away. They continue to watch the movie periodically petting. Sally reaches back to kiss Adam, arching her back, revealing a little more cleavage than she intended. Paul trying to subtly catch glimpses. Paul stands up abruptly. Right, well, I'm off to bed then. Uh, you don't want to watch the rest? Uh, well, have a good sleep. Paul leaves the living room and goes into his own bedroom, closing the door behind him. Alone at last? Oh yeah? What do you have in mind? Sally turns to face him. She sits on his lap. Well, I've got a few ideas. She kisses Adam and starts to lift his, his shirt over his head. Would you, would you rather go in the bedroom? No, oh, let's stay here. You just relax. Sally climbs off Adam's lap and kneels on the floor. She reaches for his belt, unbuckles it, and slowly lowers his zipper, raising an eyebrow. Adam leans back, smiling. Sally stops abruptly. What's wrong? Can you feel that? It feels like we're moving. Adam sits up and notices the caravan is quickly swaying from side to side. What is it? Paul. What's he doing? What do you think he's doing, the dirty guy? Adam gestures in motion with his hand. Sally bursts out laughing. Are you serious? He's, uh, well, he's quite the athlete. Pretty much every night. It'll be over soon. Sally sits back and looks at Adam. She has an unsure look on her face. Everything okay? Well, it kind of feels weird doing this in here. Well, as you know, he's doing that. Can we not just ignore it? I'll try. Sally continues and starts to remove Adam's jeans. They're rocking, then abruptly stops. Sally looks up. See? It's over. Sally smiles and runs her hands up his stomach and chest. Adam leans back, enjoying the attention. Sally's head moves down towards Adam's lower regions. The swaying starts again. Oh, bloody hell. Seriously? Sally stops and sits back. Oh, don't stop. Sorry, Adam. It's a bit of a mood killer. I think the moment's gone. Adam pulls his jeans back up and Sally sits next to him. Can I make it up to you? Oh, uh, don't, don't be silly. Um, no, no making up needed. <sighs> He's really going for it. Yeah, he's minging. They sit in silence, both of them swaying to the shaking of the caravan. Sally yawns deeply. Why don't we go to bed? If you want to stay over, that is. Sally nods her head, and Adam helps her up. <laughs> did, did, was her head, did her head weigh so much that she fell? <laughs> That's what it sounds like. Sally nods her head and Adam helps her up. <laughs> oh dear, sorry. Sally nods her head and Adam helps her up. They both start walking towards Adam's room, creeping past Paul's door. As they do so, they can hear a muffled grunting noise. Sally has a look of disbelief and disgust on her face as Adam guides her away. Looking like extras from Star Trek. <laughs> 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 can, can we let, let's just clarify something here this really happened it genuinely and, and on and on more than one occasion so I think it, we can it, say it, it was both a nightly of us, occurrence wasn't it yeah and both of us can attest to having nights of passion ruined by said person and uh, yeah it, it's pretty minging isn't it when he's been Obviously, looking at what's been going on between Adam and Sally, and thought mm, one for the bank, you know. I think uh, I think going back to real life, um, 
because I remember the first, I do remember vividly, and we've spoke about this for years since the first time it ever happened. And it literally happened like that. I think you and I were talking to some some girls that would that come over who I can't remember um who they were, but he did get up abruptly and just leave. And then we're talking. Do you remember? We were just talking away and we had some music playing and stuff like that. And we're just mm. all having a bit of a chat. And then suddenly we started shaking. And that conversation really happened. What's going on? And me and you looked at each other. Yeah. And very quickly, I think we realized what was happening. And remember, mm-hmm. these caravans are on breeze blocks. So there's nothing really holding well, them up apart from like. Yeah, they have like jacked. Blocks. They have jacked legs, don't they? So yeah. the legs are the numbies. But, but that creates sort of a a, a type of suspension. And if, if you walked heavily up the caravan, it would it would shake a little bit. It needs that because of you know high winds and things. It needs to be able to move. Now, unfortunately, if you're masturbating in the middle of a caravan, Dead it's going to rock a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that he, whole cantilever thing. Definitely. Yeah, it was it was pretty bad. So, uh, yeah, there was no. I mean, he was a young man. He had urges, but at the same time, it was really off putting. Can I can I tell the most the most disturbing bit of all of this? One, the most disturbing bit, and you, and you know this mm-hmm. is when it stopped, he never came back out. Well, I don't see. No, I, I remember no, that. See, there was no no. The bathroom was and the kitchen and the sink and you know, the place where you'd usually go to you know mm. clean yourself up. He never used to appear again, so he well, was gone for the night. I mean, there's a lot to be said for um, a special flannel and baby wipes. We don't know what he or had in his room. Or yeah. a sock. There was or a, sock a sock left over. There was, there a, was sock. a sock. And it was a, yeah. it was a very still stiff wear, sock. I still wear that one occasionally. I <laughs> still wear it. It was very starchy. Yes. <laughs> Interior, caravan, Adam's bedroom, morning. Adam lies on his back with his eyes closed. He appears asleep. The cover's up to his chin. A half-smile appears on his face as he begins breathing heavily through his mouth. After a few seconds, he shudders and a quiet moan escapes him. His face changes to a look of delight and relief. The quilt ruffles and Sally appears from beneath the covers. Her hair tangled as she cuddles into Adam, subtly rubbing her index finger across her bottom lip. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> what did you just say? What was she doing? She Why did you do it at the same time? Because I was uh, I was showing you what you she was really doing. You really threw me that. I don't know why you acted that out for me. Because I thought, you know, no. there was a mild change there. We've, we've discussed this. We've discussed this already with scenes that are a bit promiscuous. Please stop wagging your tongue. Please... Please do not act it out. Rub uh, and do you, was it rubbing or running? Uh, running. Well, she's she running her index finger across her bottom lip. She ran what? it across like that. Oh, okay. Uh, just I getting see, I, like she I had something on her lip. She went. Got yeah. Sorry, I, I was a bit slow on the uptake then. But that's Probably why I was, I was trying what... to show you. That's what I was trying to show you. She wasn't. Thank you. Thank you. And you look like you've done that before. Mm. Um, you know. <laughs> That was amazing. Told you I'd make it up to you. You didn't need to. I wanted to. Since your roommate ruined the passionate moment last night. Yeah, he has a habit of doing that. They lay in silence for a few moments. Adam running his fingers lightly along her arm. What are all the running fingers going on? There's a lot of finger running. There, There really is. Is there something I can do for you? Like what? Well... Not the only one with good <clears throat> skills. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm quite the orator, I have you know. Oh. So how many languages do you speak then? <laughs> you know what I mean. Make it up to me. When? Tonight. I'm in the mayor venue again. Why don't you meet me and you can come back to mine? Oh. Uh, tonight. I might be busy, I'm afraid. Doing what? Well, um, trimming Paul's toenails. It, it's been arranged for weeks. The angle grind is booked and everything. That is gross. Sally laughs. So I'll turn that then. Yeah. And you don't mind? Mind what? Uh, other people. 
seeing us together. Why would I mind that? Well, you do have a reputation for getting about. I was literally warned to stay away from you when I first arrived here. Uh, okay. I, I, I don't quite know how to take that. I didn't mean to offend. It's just, well, you know, you have had a load of girls. Rumours, Sally. Don't believe everything people tell you. Is it, though? There's a sudden awkwardness as Adam goes silent. Sally also seems very uncomfortable. Anyway, I don't care about any of that. I think you're lovely. Thanks. Sally stirs and gets up out of the bed. She quickly dresses and runs her fingers through her fiery red hair. So tonight then, yeah? Adam nods. Sally leans over and kisses him on the cheek. She turns and leaves. Adam rolls over and closes his eyes. It's, uh, yeah, aw awkward moment there. <laughs> I think Adam's finally getting called out on what he's been up to, you know. His reputation is so profound. People have been warned about him, literally, as they arrived on resort. I mean, that's crazy, isn't it? Well, I don't know, Steve. You you know, a lot of people were warned against you as well back in the day. You know, I wish it wasn't. I wish it wasn't actually true. But yeah, I mean, we all went, we had a moments. You know, some some of us were a little adventurous at times, and I think sometimes people got the wrong idea about our intentions, and and that's the way it is. You know, have you uh, have you had any um, awkward morning after moments, Mike? You know, uh, when you perhaps partaken in something that uh, you regretted or. No, I learned early on that if you don't, if you pretend to be asleep and you just lie there with your eyes closed, like you're, you're deep in sleep, they, they tend to go away when they get hungry. <laughs> so you have to starve <laughs> them out. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, I, re I do remember this one time, actually, where she just wouldn't go. And then I did have to face <laughs> the music because um, I thought I can't lay her anymore. I need to go to the toilet. <laughs> oh, that that is genuinely horrible, isn't it? And I don't know if I told this story on a previous episode um it, it escapes me but i i when i was working um uh, i'd had been working at a, a theme park for a little while uh, as a ride attendant i'd seen a girl sort of not too seriously but you know we went out for a little bit and things finished and and i left the theme park and then they had the end of year party and i got invited um subsequently i'd actually dated one of these girl one of this this girl's friends and she wasn't very happy about it um but then the evening of the party i apologized and one thing led to another and and i went home with her but she still lived at home with her parents so you know we had a a, a wonderful night together and the next morning uh she was like um yeah um i know you stayed over last night but um my dad's really strict and if he sees you in the house he'll kill you and he'll kill me so um we need to wait till he goes to work and then then you can leave um yeah um her dad wasn't working that day um so basically her she kept going downstairs to try and see what he was doing to get him out and i was in the room bearing in mind i'd gone in the room that night unable to go to the toilet till three o'clock in the afternoon till he finally left and i was in so much pain my bladder was killing me and i thought i will he, he will genuinely kill me if he finds me in his daughter's room so i'm just gonna have to sit here and you know develop a bladder infection while i wait to escape the house like some sort of terrible so you terrible needed person. to go to necessity there and just have a pee in the jewelry box or something wow whoa where, where did that come from i mean i could have done that in a window or in a yeah you have to MacGyver that. So you have to acknowledge the fact that, you know, body biology, that needs to happen. Uh, you can't escape from the room. So you have to then look for any means necessary to relieve yourself. Um, we'll talk about this afterwards, but yeah, you should have <laughs> MacGyvered that. Interior, main venue, day. Bernie is pacing by the main door to the venue ushering a throng of dancers and performers in. Stage crew, dressed in black, are moving sets, adjusting lighting rigs and doing their best to coordinate as they move in and out of the venue. 
Um, have you got a moment, Bernie? Um, what is it, Eddie, darling? I am extremely busy. Well, wouldn't you prefer to do the dress rehearsal on the actual stage? I mean, it's going to be really hard to block it in the studio and then try to replicate it here. Bernie stares intently at Eddie, his face reddening in anger. Let me repeat myself again, but really slowly, so your tiny cockney brain can compute what I've asked for. Closed rehearsal. No one in or out. No sneak peeks and no main stage. Do your job and let me do mine. Do you understand me, Eddie? Bernie, for the love of G Stop. Yes or no. Eddie glares at Bernie, turns and walks away. Bloody amateurs. There's a loud, shrill scream coming from the stage. A group of dancers all gather around as Bernie spins to see what's happening. He marches onto the stage. What the hell is going on? There's water on the stage. She slipped. A clearing opens up to see the head girl lying on the stage crying. Tears flooding down her cheeks and she holds her leg. Oh dear, what's wrong, darling? It's my knee, Bernie. I, it, I think it's twisted. C can you walk? Someone get her up. Two dancers help her to her feet. As soon as she puts weight on her leg, she screams in pain and immediately goes back down to the floor. <laughs> it can't be that bad. It really hurts. Just put some ice on it and strap it up. The show must go on, dear. Bernie, she needs to go to the hospital. You can see it's swelling already. <laughs> oh, and you're a doctor as well now, are you? Ali doesn't say anything. She walks away to get help. I am utterly cursed. Oh, the whole world is against me. What are we going to do without my principal? We bloody well open tonight. Well, I know the part. I, I can step in. You? <laughs> this isn't a drag show, Robin. Last time I looked, you weren't a woman. I mean, the flabby man tits could almost pass, but no. So why have I been understudying men? Pity. Pure pity. We shall have to postpone. Someone go and get me Alan. Eddie walks past. Alan is here. He's over at the back. Bernie follows Eddie, pointed to see Mark and Alan deep in conversation, hidden in the corner. What are they doing here? I said closed set. What can I say? He's a boss. Bernie strides over to Alan and Mark. They both stop their conversation to greet Bernie. Gentlemen, <laughs> um, we have a problem. Uh, my principal is injured and I have no time to recast. We shall have to regrettably postpone. I thought you had understudies. An understudy who's male. It's our female need that's injured. The show goes ahead as planned, Bernie. Did you not hear me? It is simply not possible. And you're not hearing me. The show goes ahead tonight as planned. You've been told. There is too much at stake. Glenn is here for crying out loud. It's your job to deal with this. So make it work. Bernie goes to speak, hesitates, and instead storms off. Alan throws a look of disbelief at Mark as the two turn on their heels and exit the venue. Exterior, executive suites, day. Glenn and John exit the suites and stand outside. There's a stand being erected and a red ceremonial ribbon and bow are being draped across the door to the apartment block. Glenn is smiling and looks very happy. Much better in real life, John. I can see you're a man of talent. We should discuss ideas for your next project. <laughs> Well, it's a team effort, Glenn. You're only as good as those around you. I do have lots of ideas about where we can go next, though. Go for it. What now? 
Pitch me. John shuffles on his feet, scratching his head and trying to think. Uh, well, uh, well, I do have this one idea, like, if we tear down the pavilion, that space will mean we can overhaul the food court, insert something like, I don't know, bowling or a cinema, a, a roller skating rink might be a good opportunity as well. But the pavilion is, is one of my entertainment venues, right? Well, yeah, but it was only supposed to be a temporary structure and the warranty is running out in the next six months, but you'll still have the main venue. That becomes more, you know, like a exclusive. And then you can half the entertainment budget. You know, win-win for all. Entertainment is a lifeblood of this resort, John. You take half of it away and what are we? People come here because they want to be entertained. Get close to the team. It's pure escapism. I mean, my view is that we should give them more. Push the boat out even further. Even if it means less revenue. Glenn puts his arm around John's shoulder. We get this right, we'll be printing our own money. Uh, not interrupting, am I? Alan strides up behind them. I hope you've got good news for me, Alan. Yes and no. We we tried almost all the names on your Hollywood list. Uh, some couldn't make it at such short notice. Uh, Cruz is filming here on a Kubrick movie, but we couldn't even speak to him. Tell me you have at least one movie star. Alan clears his throat. <clears throat> well, uh, well, we did reach out to some people. Um, so <clears throat> uh, we can get the pig from Babe, uh, though it's a lot bigger now. Um, oh, uh, and, and there's some kids shooting a wizard movie who can be free, and Stallone's brother Frank is willing to make an appearance. No. A pig, some kids from a magic film, or a lookalike? Well, I, I do hear the wizard film might be, might, you know, might be a bit of a hit. <laughs> Stupid. We all know that magic doesn't sell. Mark my words. Well, that's that's all we have to work with, I'm afraid. So, what are other options? We go back to what we go back to our original plan. And is that the best we can do? At short notice, yes. And and look, for the price of a Dion. We can get a rice, a kabusi, a barrymore, possibly even stretch to a Davro. Rich and Judy could be interested, but they, but they want a sweet each named after them. Glenn toys it over for a few moments. Fine. Choose the best three and tell Richard and Judy they can have one sweet and a single appearance fee. They come as a pair. Alan nods his head and immediately leaves. Ah, oh, wow. So, um... <sighs> Do we think that that Glenn was a bit hopeful, hoping for Hollywood names to come and name sweets after? I think it says a lot about Glenn's. I, I think that's the best way to 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 justify Glenn. Glenn what am I saying here? I, I don't know. You tell me. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think it's the best way to describe Glenn's cat. Glenn's an optimist. Glenn is. Glenn wants to push the boat out. He thinks big. If you think right back to Glenn's very first appearance with Bernie, he wants big. He wants spectacle. He wants West End style. He wants glamour. He wants celebrityism. Um, and then what the what he's getting is kind of small minded UK thinking with these guys that um, actually were never good. You know, you, I don't think they ever ever had any intention of attracting anyone major. Um, I've, I've never heard of that before. Yeah. Um, it's difficult, isn't it? Because you've got to remember what what Glenn wants and what the holiday makers that go to that resort want are two very different things. And it almost feels like Glenn is trying to impress his rich friends by, by the, the names he can generate, by the things, rather than as a vehicle to sell holidays. It feels very much like a a boast or a show, you know, like driving around in a, uh, you know, a Lamborghini or a, or a Ferrari or something. They're not practical. They're not what you need to get to places, but they're very showy. They are. And I think it also says a great deal about Glenn, because we don't know a lot about Glenn and we don't know about his past and we don't know about his upbringing. Now he might be a very big fish in, in, you know, the continent of Africa in South Africa, but, He's come to the UK now, and he might not boast that same camera power. And um, you know this. And, and sorry, um, just to bounce around. This is before kind of like moguls became celebrities just because they were rich. You know, I know we live in that time now where yeah. a lot of businessmen can you, do you things can, like you can argue that. But you still had people like 
you know, Robert Maxwell and, you know, the media, media moguls media that were mogul. really, really, you know, big. And, and, and maybe it's just that that's what he's trying to break into. He's trying to be as world renowned as that. I'm the guy that brought these people to this place. And, you know, this is, it, it's, it's very much a status thing, I think, for Glenn. Um, how many, um, how many South African moguls can you think of? Just right now, off the top of your head. <laughs> well, I wasn't expecting to be put on the spot, but I'm, <laughs> I, you know, there there are there are multiple, you know, totally, and I'm, uh, totally multiple. Because you know, um, I mean, obviously, this this Africa is was a rich source of diamond mining and things when people made a lot of money doing that, and you know, it, it's there's a lot of um, a lot of rich folk down there. So, um, how many Russian? Um, og- how do you say og- oligarchs? Og- oligarchs? Can you uh, can you name? Um, well, at least one. Roman Abramovich was one. Yeah. There's one. Why? Uh, and why? Why? Why can I name him? Because he's well known in the UK. He's well having known previously in the UK. owned a, a football club. So, you know, how but... many American moguls can you name? Oh, quite, quite a lot. Because it's, yeah, I suppose I'm, it's I'm, I'm whole... the point. Yeah, the I point didn't I'm realize we were doing a pop quiz. To be fair, <laughs> I was going to be. Otherwise, I might have but... done some revision. You know, kind of. No, no, no. The point I'm trying to make, though, how is... many fingers am I holding up, Mike? <laughs> one, and it's a middle yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um... I think you'll find it's two. <laughs> But the point is, um, I also do. I that. think for Glenn as a character, um, when we see that character exploration around who he really is and what he's all about and how he made his money, we still know very little about him. But we love his optimism. Mm. But he does. He's the money man, but he also conveys a little bit of fear. There's a little bit of edginess to him that people won't really challenge that much. I think Alan's doing a good job at negotiating around him. Um, yeah. But you know, Alan wants the world, so give me it. Yeah. Sorry, Glenn wants the world, so give me it. And and while well, that's it, he's not been used to people saying no to him. I think, you know, he's very much surrounded by yes men. Um, and if he wants something to to happen, it happens. So you know, I think we'll just have to continue to see if he gets what he truly wants and and deserves, which uh, you know we'll be able to address in the next week's. I like I'd say it, final episode of this chapter. The crescendo of season two, chapter two. So we will stick around for that and find what out. What have we more. got to look forward to for next week's episode? Oh, I think thrills, spills, revelations, shocks, dramas, and uh, explosion of explosion. Yeah. yeah, fireworks. Fireworks. I think is the best fireworks. term to use. Yeah. Physical and metaphorical. So make sure you stay tuned in for that next week. So, Mike, it's come to that time of the day where we must reflect. And I'd like you to regale us with your wonderful words of wisdom to get us through another week until we can bring another episode. At some point this week, you may be feeling down. At some point, you may be having a bad moment or a bad day. When that happens... When that happens, turn to Chris Akabusi, because his laugh will brighten your day. And on that note, what more needs to be said other than thank you for listening. We'll see you next time on Bad Scripts. Until then, goodbye. Bad Scripts was written and performed by Mike Garlier and Steve Jones. A Beach Tide production.